Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are actress Deb Deborah Puett and actor, producer Richard Winter Stanbridge. Actress Deborah Puett was born and raised in Pennsylvania. She studied at the professional studies, uh, the professional studio for actors in Chicago, where she made her debut in the world premiere of Rebecca Gilman's The Glory of Living. Now, living in Los Angeles, she's worked in TV, film, and on the stage. She sits on the Artistic and Literary Committee at the Rogue Machine, one of the hottest, newest creative theater companies in Hollywood. Did you always want to be an actress? I was a dancer. Oh, you were? I was a dancer, yes. Um, I grew up in a tiny, tiny town where you only see actors on TV. I just didn't have any kind of a role model for it. It didn't seem like a reasonable thing. But dancing, you know, was around. There were some good studios. And so I, I grew up as a dancer. And then um, it became pretty clear that I was never going to make my living doing that. I just wasn't, I wasn't built for it, I think, uh, emotionally or really physically. Um, I was always a little bit too tall and so so when I perfect physique uh, <laughs> <laughs> the model right so um, <clears throat> when I I moved to Chicago and saw a lot of people working as actors and knew that it had always been in the back of my mind but this seemed like a place where I could really make that happen but you went to study in Chicago I you actually didn't I moved to Chicago. Um, I moved to Chicago for personal reasons, oh. and shortly after getting there, oh. realized that people were making people were acting. They were doing this thing that I'd always kind of thought about but never done. Oh, and I then see. I decided to study. Oh, it I all see. happened pretty fast. So it did. It, so it, it came kind of later after your dance. Well, after high school, after, yeah, yeah like after you high school, you were gonna, yeah, right. Well, Chicago is a great theater town, it is. so you must have had a, a lot of access to things. I was really fortunate. I studied with a man named Steven Ivich at his studio for a year and started auditioning right after and, and very quickly was cast in the world premiere that you talked about. Yes, and Rebecca Gilman, yeah. who had gotten all kinds of, an, of, of awards for her writing. Well, The Glory of Living was really the, the play that put her on the map. It was after The Glory of Living. It was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. I know. Can you imagine? Yeah. And you were the lead in it? Yes, I was so <laughs> lucky. I really was. I didn't even know what I was involved in at the time. You know, it all... It all came very fast, and I was really fortunate. But did you did acting come really easy to you? Um, it must have. It did. It always felt like a good fit. I mean, I work worked and work hard at it, but it it feels like a good fit. So you did a lot of uh, theater in Chicago. Yeah, then. I did. I worked after I did the Glory of Living. Um, I I really just went from show to show to show. Uh, so I did most of my studying on the stage, just watching working professionals. Did you go from show to show to show because of the professional studio for actors where you were working? No. Did they help you? No. Just I mean, no. I, I, he helped me in terms of applying my craft, Stephen did, but it wasn't through connections in that studio. It wasn't? No, it's a really small school that I don't even know if, it's, if, it's still, if he's still running it or not. I think he may have uh -huh. stopped. But so I... I just got the job, you know, doing the Glory of Living at Circle Theater, and got the attention of some other theaters. Oh, I see. So that's and how then, it happens. Yeah. And then, what was that story about? Glory of Living is about. It was based on the true story of the youngest woman ever to be sentenced to death in America. Right. It was she was very a serial killer. Heavy. Yeah. And you played a serial killer. Yeah. It was very heavy. Yeah. How did you get into that? Oh, mode? I don't know. It was scarily easy. Scarily natural, I suppose. She, at the heart of her, she really was a scared girl who had never been taken care of. Mm. And so when she was influenced by the wrong person, she was led down a path that she didn't resist, um, really, because um. she didn't 
know anything better or no. she didn't know anything good. So, so, so that was a really heavy, heavy play. When I met you, my husband doing that play. Did you? I did. Oh, so that was great. Everything <laughs> happened in Chicago. Didn't I know, it? it did. You should move back to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> but instead of going to New York, mm -hmm. which is like the logical thing for people who are living in Chicago, you came to LA. You'd be surprised. There is a huge Chicago mafia out here. Is Just, there? Yeah, that's what we call it. <laughs> Tons. I have more friends from Chicago out that here than I did them? than I did in Chicago. Really? Yeah, I mean New York is one option, but we, uh, my husband and I, gave birth to a son, um, rather by surprise. I mean, I knew I was pregnant, but we hadn't we hadn't exactly planned to start a family that early. And I couldn't I could not imagine moving to New York with no. an infant. I just couldn't do it. No. I I couldn't be poor, you know what I mean, and have a tiny baby with me. This is the best so place. So we for moved that. here, yeah. yeah, and we found ourselves in the midst of a really vibrant theater community. Is Such, he an actor too? He's an actor and a director. Oh, so it's perfect. Well, you got here. You started getting TV roles. You had recurring roles. I worked on Strong Medicine, and this is how I met John Flynn, who is the artistic director of Rogue Machine. Oh, so he knew your work. He directed me on his show, awesome. Strong Medicine, yeah. And then you started making films. You were in a film with Harrison Ford and Ashley yeah, Judd. Yeah, that just came out on DVD like last week. I think it's called Crossing Over, and it's an ensemble drama. And Oh, it is an ensemble, yeah. so you worked with everyone. How no, did no, no, you, um, no. I didn't work with everyone. Uh, by Ensemble, I mean, it's it's sort of built in the structure of um, the movie Crash. People compare it to oh, a lot. Yes, yes. Intersecting storylines. Story so yeah. there are all these stories going on at once, and I was in one of the stories. I see, yeah. I see. Um, and you did a one-person play. The Give piece, Me Shelter. Oh, that was actually... <laughs> That did you write it? I did. I did. And it's um, it's not quite a one-person show. Oh, I thought it was. No. At Rogue Machine, we have these events called Rant and Rave, where writers get up and present their own work. Oh, this went. So this yeah. is a good move into Rogue Machine. So you can tell us a little bit about what they do and why it's such a fabulous it's amazing. new company. It's amazing what, what the company has done in the short time it's been around. Last season was our first, and we produced three fully mounted plays. Um, the Complete Female Stage Beauty, American Dead, and Razorback. And when you're in the company, do you do everything? Yeah. You I, do everything. You do. We're, you're expected to do, you're expected to clean toilets. <laughs> you know, you're expected, <laughs> we have committees. Everything? We have committees and everybody has do to you? sit on a committee and everyone has to come and work front of house, sell tickets at the box office. And then some of us are actors, some of us are writers, directors. It's not an actor-driven company. It is oh, different. Oh, so you don't have, like I could come work there and work the front of the house? Sure you could. But Absolutely. how do you, do you have to audition? How to become part of the, of the membership? Right now the way it works is we invite people into the company um, once they've done a show with us. If actors are interested in coming to, do, to the company f before that, they're really encouraged to come and hang out and volunteer their, their time and get to know who we are because it's important to know whether you're a good fit or not. Yeah, so you, know? so you all work together so closely, don't yeah, you? Yeah, it's a community and you need to make sure that it's the right community. So what, what do uh, a, a board member like you uh -huh. on the artistic, what, what do you do on the artistic committee? We are a loosely formed artistic committee right now because the company's so young, but there were a bunch of people that John saw as being heavily involved that he invited to come, and so occasionally we sit down and talk about the direction that the company's taken, oh. we, we set the season. We Do you, so you pick the plays? We, do you pick the plays? Yes, collaboratively we pick the plays. And, and how do you do that? Do you all read different things? Or do, do your friends call you and say, I have a play? Sometimes, because I have some friends who are really fine writers, and people will submit stuff to me. We actually have the chair of our literary committee is um, in charge of, keeping, of getting all the solicitations. So most of them come through him, but then some, some of them will come through us. I worked, at, uh, I worked at Laguna Playhouse last year with a wonderful playwright named Catherine Butterfield. So I know this great playwright who has I other see, plays, and she'll I submit see. them. And then we read them, but we have to agree on them by consensus. It takes, you know, more than one person needs to think it's a really good play for us to move forward with but it. But is that different, the literary committee, from the artistic committee? Yeah, it oh, is. Oh, it is. Yeah. So the literary is reading. The mm -hmm. artistic is looking at the way Rogue Machine the is going. going. Where is the theater? <laughs> We're located, we are in residence about seven or eight months out of the year at Theater Theater, which is on Pico Boulevard, just west of La Brea. 
Oh, mm -hmm. it's a small, what, how many, 99? Two spaces now, actually. <coughs> One space is about 88 seats, and the other space is about 33 seats. Oh, so, well, what happens in a small little space, like 33 seats? A lot can happen in a space like that. Really? It's amazing, yeah. I think some of the best theater I've ever done has been in spaces that tiny. And, and do you feel like you're really getting it out to a... a audience when there's only 33 people there? If you run it long enough, and actually I don't, if the play's good and the, the work is good, I don't care if I'm in front of five people or 500. Is that right? Yeah. So what is uh, uh, the award-winning productions? Because you've done, I mean, you've only been there a year, but you have uh, award-winning productions, right? Right. So last year we started with the Complete Female Stage Beauty by Jeffrey Hatcher, which is uh, a period costume <clears throat> comic drama. Okay, so costume, a new company. Where do you, you don't have anything in the closet, do you? No, they, you know, it's, what do you do? it costs someone, a lot of money. Does someone sew for you? Do you have a costume? Stephanie Cur Curly Schwartz is our resident director and she's amazing. She did the set and the costumes for that piece and uh, she put together costumes for an 18 member ensemble that were out of this world. People can go on our website and see some pictures. Uh, and so, of uh, what she put together. Yeah. So where does she find those things? Does she have to rent them? Well, she has a lot of re uh, relationships with local theaters, like Center Theater Group. Oh, so you can exchange? Well, you know, you Center, <laughs> yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. We're so small, and our budgets can be so small, that often places, bigger places like Center Theater Group, you know, the, the Mark Taper Forum, will borrow, will lend oh. things to us. Well, th that was the other thing I was going to say. Um, do you work with other theaters? We haven't Would collaborated. Your... We haven't collaborated with another theater on a production yet. It's only our second year, um, and we haven't yet moved a production. But I think both things are possible, especially in this economic downturn. A, a lot of companies are coupling up to save re uh, resources. When you're on the stage all the time, can you still audition for film and TV? Yeah. Well, how do you do work that? The 99 seat contract that we use allows. Because equity members are basically working for free, it allows the members to at any time step out and take oh, more remuneration. How do they say it? Money. Yeah, money. <laughs> work that pays you more money. <laughs> so oh, I still audition. How, oh, it is. Yeah, I mean, you always hope that you're not going to affect the production, and we do have understudies. So, uh, but you know, it's you're not. It's not like a contract at. Um, Center we, Theater Group, where they're can. paying you $1,000 a week and they expect you to be there. Okay, before we leave, and I know you went like, give me shelter. Tell us just a little bit about that, that play. Well, Rogue Machine has these did nights. Did you write it? I did. Rogue, mm -hmm. It's not a play. Rogue Machine has um. these evenings called Rant and Rave, where they gather like eight writers who write around a theme and then get up and, pre and uh, present their work off the page. So it's a performance, but you're still, you've got your pages with you because it's, it's like not eight improv. minutes long. Not no. improv at all. Mm -mm, no. So, um, so I wrote an essay that was about <laughs> about the conf some confusion I had in my earlier earlier years about the path that I would choose, and you know, it's just another one of the things that we're doing to reach out to the community. It's a great it's a great night where you get to see just all these terrific writers just put their stuff out. It was hilarious. So, did the writers read their own things? Yep. Or, oh, they it's do. always the writers reading their own mm. things, and we have about one every one or two months. People can check that out on the website too. That sounds fabulous. Can you and tell them the website? No, but they <laughs> can, can just, I tell they them? They can know. They can find out <laughs> easily, can't they? Yeah, they can yeah. Google us. Rogue Machine. Yeah, that's yeah. easy. Well, Deborah. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you for having I'm me. I'm so glad. I know you're running off to rehearsal. I am. I am for Stop Kiss, which we're about to oh, which we're yeah. about to produce. We and, open mm -hmm. on July 9th. And what is that? It's the LA premiere. This this is a play that did mm -hmm. big, big, big business in New York at the Public in 2000. Oh. It won an OB, I believe, and was a was a critical darling. And it's about it's a story about two women who unexpectedly fall in love and some tragic consequences that ensue. And so you're one of the women. I am. Who's the other woman? Christina Harrison is co-starring with me. And we have a wonderful ensemble of six actors. Oh, that's great. And this, uh, the rights of this show have been held from Los Angeles for nine years. And we, oh. we, so we had the long-awaited L.A. premiere. So it takes good friends in high places. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And don't go away. We'll be right back with Richard Winter Strawbridge. Hi.
Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Actor, producer, teacher, musician, Richard Winter Stanbridge was born and raised in Surrey, England. He attended St. Mary's Prep Choir School, the Lewis Academy of Music, and the London Academy of Dramatic Arts. Yes, no, 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 music. No. no, music and dramatic. That's very important. We've got music. to say the music. Yes, yes, because you've got Richard. Absolutely. You've got, you've got Richard, who's the musician. That's right. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, so uh, Richard was a jazz club singer, yeah. a teacher, a coach at the Royal... Well, I coached Royal Shakespeare Company actors. I know. Yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. And you were the head of the drama department, yes, at Bush at, Davis Ballet School. At the which, ballet school. Why which, do you need a, a drama department there? Uh, because the, the ballet dancers have to learn mime. So, uh -huh. so they learn through the skills and the techniques that we teach in drama, they learn mime. And uh, so they can apply that to the dance. That's a very Russian thing, isn't oh, it? Yeah, yes, yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, shall I go on? Oh, yes. You produced plays, musicals, and opera, yes. which is very difficult difficult Absolutely. in England and the US. Yeah. So as a boy, did you want to be a, a musician? Yeah, you did. I think, I, think, uh, <laughs> I think really that's where it all started. I had a wonderful uh, family of musicians, particularly on my mother's side, although oh. my father's uh, father was very musical and he was actually tone deaf. Oh, you had no choice. I had no choice. <laughs> I had no choice. And, and I, did, uh, I did what I could uh, in my early days. I, I think I started playing the piano, just playing around on the piano when I was about four. I seemed to be very, so long? very yeah. young, yes. And then uh, could work a few things out by myself. And then by the time I was five, I think my parents uh, got me my first piano teacher. And um, I, I did that for a few years. But that was piano. That but was what piano. about singing? Oh, you were singing like a came, big singer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, well, the How singing thing started uh, a few years later. Maybe I was six. <laughs> you were six. But, but you were not six when you were at the Ritz. The Ritz Hotel? No, no, that was much later. But you see, to get to the Ritz, I, I had the most amazing education, I think, in music. Uh, and we mentioned the greatest, all those. Yeah, it was a great um, choir school. It was <coughs> one of three um, choir schools in England that was not affiliated to a cathedral or a <coughs> collegiate church. Why is that so important? I know we talked that you mentioned this yeah. before, but why is that, that it's not affiliated? Why does that make um, it better? Well, it's not that it's, it makes it better. It's just that it had the same quality as any cathedral choir school. But, um, and to be honest, we, we often substituted for Westminster Abbey, St. Paul's Cathedral, oh, so you could go and in? Guildford Cathedral choirs when they were on holiday. Uh. Um, so we did that. We did sing in the great cathedrals and we toured a lot. But um, it, it was a great choir school, Reigate St. Mary's Choir School. Yeah. So you were the director of a... Uh, later on I was, yes. Um, but let me just, get, just say something about St. Mary's because the discipline of singing was instilled in me at that very young age and it really was something that I could apply to my life as I went through it. Well, um, it looks like everything you took though you applied to your life from singing mm -hmm. to piano playing yeah. to drama. I knew that I was going to spend my life in the performing arts. Uh, I, I wanted to do that. It was just something right there, right from the beginning. But uh, you taught at the university. You taught at yeah. UCLA? Yeah, UCLA. Um, I, I did an extension course. I taught two courses at, uh, at UCLA Extension. Uh, one was speech and the oh. other was classical acting because of the Royal. trans... When we transferred from England to here, uh, I, I started teaching uh, just to get my feet on the ground. Okay, one other thing that I think is really interesting mm. is that you're an organ scholar. Oh, well, <laughs> I don't know that I'm a scholar. <laughs> I certainly play the organ. I certainly you play. You play the organ, yeah. but that's so difficult too. Well, it is. Well, it's all about it's that discipline thing again, you see. And what is it? You have to play your feet, you have to play well, your... Well, uh, there's all the manuals, there's the yeah. stops, there's the pistons, yeah. uh, there's all the pedals and the swell pedals and what have you. Yes, there's a lot to think about. What do you think about the Disney, uh, Disney Hall? Yeah, I think... Quiet, uh, uh, organ. The organ is splendid. 
Is it? I have to say, I went to, I've been to a couple of concerts there, just organ. The only problem I have with it is the acoustic after it for the organ. I think the building is acoustically brilliant, but for the organ, it is, the moment the organist takes his hands off the keyboard, it's as dead as dead can be. It stops and it's and, supposed to go on? Well, you know, when you're, when you've been Breathing. in a position like me <laughs> and you've been uh, brought up in cathedrals and large churches uh, in, as a choral scholar, then, you know, you, you get that sound of, yes, there must be a little bit of reverberation. Oh, I see, I see. And, and Disney Hall doesn't seem to have that for the organ. But you know what does have it? First Congregational Church oh, yeah. on 6th and Commonwealth. Oh, yes. Wonderful. I'm sure Wonderful. you've been there because yes. isn't that the, one of the largest organs? It is or? one of them. So I understand, yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and they have uh, organ recitals at mm -hmm. noon and yep. all different times. Yep. I, I think it's amazing. Yep. And what a big following. Yes, yes. Um, I, I attended some of the Bach concerts there for a while. And they're great. They were just wonderful. Yeah, yes. it's very gothic, the church. Yes. It's yes. wonderful. Yes. Haven't you acted along the way, though? We've talked about singing and all this other... For my sins, I background. did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think uh, acting um, didn't elude me entirely. For about five or six years, I certainly did um, my fair share of stage acting in England, oh, you uh, did. classical acting predominantly, Shakespeare, um, and then I did some films and I was very privileged to have worked with um, David Lean, with ah. um, uh, John Glenn and uh, with oh, one of the funniest directors, he's a great guy, Terry Gilliam. So, uh, oh, you, you know, were so in those I, films? I've done, uh, I was in, um, I worked with, the David Lean film was Passage to India. But they all work differently, don't they? Oh, very differently. Because David Lean and then, um, who was the last, De Terry? Yeah. Totally different, right? I did Brazil with him. It well, was totally a, different. Oh, wacko. <laughs> yeah. Great. Very, very innovative and uh, interesting. But interesting that it's back to that discipline thing. So you can take any kind of directing. Yes. Yes. And and along uh, along the way, along with this acting, you've have this passion for making sure students yeah. have a place to go. How I do you do that? I think my life has basically, whilst I say I'm in the performing arts, the performing arts was was my goal. I wanted to do something in it, either as a performer or as a producer. And essentially, <laughs> what's happened uh, is I've done the whole gambit of performing. Um, and and directing, and now I'm a producer. You're a producer, but you've yeah. also been a, a trustee on some of these yeah. educational yeah. institutes. Yes. Absolutely, uh, and that's important. Very important. Um, I I want to advocate classical music, particularly in my work, um, because uh, everybody gets this impression from what is in the press sometimes, that classical music is in decline. And to be oh, honest... Oh, we do. People say well, that you know all what? the time. I think it's a rumor that the record companies <laughs> like to put out when their sales are not so good. But let me tell you that, that classical music is more popular today than it has ever been in oh. its history. Oh, that's because good. we have to remember that um, classical music was for an elite class of people to start with. It's, it, so it was know, small. And it was paid for by them. And there was a small. But as we got into the 20th, no, even the 19th century, after Mozart um, and into the 19th century, composers were composing not just for their. Um, for the people that, that paid them their to patrons, do it. Right. Yeah, their patrons. They, they did it for the masses or began doing it for the masses. And that's where I'm at today. That's where you are as a producer. You have yeah. a film, Algar? Well, yeah, absolutely. Tell us about uh, that. Well, I, uh, I was in England two years ago filming uh, for a documentary about Sir Edward Elgar. And it was Edward Elgar's 150th anniversary. Conductor? No, I was actually directing and presenting that Was he a conductor? He was Sir, a composer, a composer and, a conductor, and a conductor and an organist. He was an all-rounder as well. He was well. an organist. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh, and he's probably, I mean, arguably England's greatest composer. Americans will know him because he composed Pomp and Circumstance. Oh, of course. Uh, but uh, a lot more of his works, like the Enigma Variations, if I can say it, or the, his uh, um, symphonies, they're absolutely stunning. So how do you produce a film? Like for How about do you, him. With difficulty because it's an art film in, in essence. But is he a I character in it? 
It's yeah. not a documentary. No, the documentary, he was the subject matter. Uh -huh. What came out of the documentary uh -huh. is a film. And now we're producing a feature film uh -huh. about a part of his life and a journey that he made in 1924 from London to uh, the Amazon. And of course, you think of Edward Elgar and you think, Edward Elgar on the Amazon? The Amazon, right. Well, how, how does that figure? Was he writing so, there? Was he what? Writing? Composing? Uh, no, he was just wanting to get over all the miseries of the First World War, losing oh. his wife, oh. losing a lot of his friends. Oh, and, so it's uh, kind of very he, dramatic. Uh, uh, very dramatic. And the story um, is centered around a lot of uh, great characters on board ship. Oh, and, that's uh, great. And they stop off at various places, and it's great fun. Can you do the same thing in the United States, or does Europe call you to do... To, to have you back to do your um, I have things. concentrated the last 12 years of my life here in Los Angeles, so I am really pushing for all I've got here. <laughs> and before we leave, yes. are we going to see you back in some hotel lounge being a jazz singer? No. I left that behind. Oh, I left that behind in the Ritz in London. <laughs> I know, but how did you play during tea time? Yeah, and in the evenings. Uh, we, we did Te Danson. And we did, uh, we did evening performances, too, with the Mayfair Dance Orchestra. And that there was, was an orchestra. orchestra. Yeah. yeah. What was yeah. The, the, the orchestra later turned into something else? No. Well, I left it with uh, a, a friend of mine when we, when we moved to America. And uh, it was a great orchestra because it was first started in about 1929 by Carol Gibbons. Then an American took uh, it over called Ray Noble. That's what I thought. Yeah. And yeah. Then, then the Second World War came and the band disbanded. And so after that, we... Um, I didn't have a Mayfair Dance Orchestra for many years, so I approached EMI and I said, look, can, do you mind, because they had all the rights on the stuff yeah. at the time, so I said, do you mind if I rekindle the spirit of the Mayfair Dance Orchestra? So I did, and we had a, uh, a residency at the Ritz in London for quite a while, and during that time, I met the Countess of Buckinghamshire, who took me under her wing because we were playing for society. Yeah, I bet it was well. beautiful. And it was great, and we did a lot of wonderful charity work. You know, That's so, yeah. so fabulous. Yeah. And I want to thank you all, and I want to thank you, Richard, thank you. for being with us Lovely today. Lovely to be here, Jen. Thank and you. keep uh, emailing me at jaquinn1 at aol.com. J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 -N at aol.com. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.